So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Farshad. For those of you who know, don't know me, I'm a lecturer in CS department, uh, MTU core campus. So uh, just a small talk about uh, software maintenance and code analysis. Um, there is also a module that I'm delivering um, that is every second semester of the year called source code. Uh, um, uh, analyzing basically. So that's pretty much uh, most of the things are also about the materials that I have and a little bit more about uh, the details of those stuff basically. So uh, first uh, let's start uh, with defining what is uh, basically software system life cycle. So in literature, there are different, uh, there might be different types of representation of this circle or this cycle basically, but all of them agreed on uh, basically most of the high level um, steps like a requirement collection, architecture, design and recovery, implementation, API selection, testing, maintenance. So usually, uh, so this, this, is, this is a cycle that can go forever as long as the software system is in use and it is called a healthy and active, basically, software system. So at the beginning, we usually start from a requirement collection when we don't have anything. So obviously you can't do the architecture before uh, collecting the requirement from the uh, customers, the stakeholder, whoever uh, basically uh, is going to use the software system. And then obviously the implementation uh, will come after architecture testing maintenance. And again, new requirements will come to the cycle. And again, you know, recovering the architecture or designing, uh, 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 or redesigning the architecture. So, uh, you know, in reality, sometimes some of these basically items are uh, lost in the uh, software uh, system cycle, basically. So some. Uh, you know, software uh, starts uh, being developed without even having an actual architecture. So, or some of them, they don't really care about maintenance, uh, uh, testing or, or, or proper API selection, things like this. So mostly in the, in the software systems life cycle, I'm going to focus in this presentation on maintenance. Um, so researchers reported that up to, in some cases, up to 90% of the whole software development costs would be devoted, would, would be allocated only on the maintenance. So that's, that's, a, that's a huge, that's a huge, you know, number, which means that the actual, the initial implementation. So when you order a software system to a team of developers, basically the the initial implementation wouldn't really cost that much. So the main cost would be spent on the maintenance. So maintenance is basically uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the main thing. So uh, to make it a little bit more clear, um, researchers again uh, compare software system or, or basically uh, introduce software system as kind of like a um, a wool, a set that wool always uh, attracts uh, dust and software system is exactly like this. As long as the software system is active and basically healthy. So I'll explain about what healthy or, or active software system is later on. Uh, but, you know, Google attracts dust and software system keeps attracting bugs and the fix uh, depends on the nature of the software system. And usually developers, this is, this is something that has been reported before a pandemic in 2019. Usually every um, basically year, uh, 111 billion lines of new software systems are developed. And definitely after pandemic, this, this, this number goes exponentially you know uh, up uh, because of all the uh, you know things that are uh, migrated online so the, the need for new software is increasing so going back to the uh, software maintenance so there are usually um, four main tasks that most of the um, uh, researchers in the field of software engineering agreed on these basically four 
different, uh, let's say, family of tasks instead of just individual tasks, because each of them will be broken down into multiple, lots of individual tasks, corrective, adaptive, perfective, preventive. So corrective is just, you know, simple enough. The, the, the names are actually very expressive, but corrective is when a, a bug is reported. So for example, uh, there is a lack of input validation you know, divided by zero is the most simplest one. Adaptive is when a, a new functionality is required or a new basically module uh, is, is required to be added into the current system. So let's say that your software system is now dealing with, uh, used to deal only with CSV files and now the input data is represented as JSON. So you need to be able to add that functionality to deal with JSON files as well. Perfective is talking about optimization. So how you can optimize basically the software system is there is no necessarily problem or bug in the system. You just want to make it better, uh, optimizing the running time or quality of, of, of output. And preventive is just, you know, you are predicting that there might be these problems in future. One of the very, very uh, stereotype example of preventive is architectural recovery. So along the time when, so when you have the initial architecture at the beginning, uh, and when you start implementing over the time, the uh, maintenance or basically the adoptive uh, part will make this the implementation to diverge from the initial architecture you have. So you need to basically, so this is, this is a potential risk, this is a potential problem. So what you need to do, you need to prevent this basically, this, this potential problem by uh, uh, applying uh, tasks that are, that are called basically architecture recovery. So see whether you need to change the architecture to make it uh, conformed to the implementation or the other way around, basically. So uh, uh, then software, so these were the family of tasks of software maintenance. But now we want to see what factors are basically important for software maintenance. So again, researchers and literature divided them into two main groups, non-technical and technical. So I start with non-technical because the focus would be on technical. So I'll talk about technical later. Non-technical, uh, which is not really directly related to the programmers, uh, would be hardware compatibility. So uh, whether the you know you are developing a software system that requires uh, uh, a large amount of uh, video, uh, VGA or graphic, basically. Uh, resources. A stable team, uh, whether you have expertise from different uh, fields, basically from different sections, front end, back end, you know, database, lots of things like this, and also feel the knowledge gap between end user and development team. You see, the, the, this is this is usually the, the problem uh, that, uh, you know, those of you who work with industry, you're probably familiar with this. So if you want to I explain something which we have basically researched in 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 the in the academic or the uh, basically scientific framework. It would be a little bit difficult to explain it to uh, to industry people. Uh, it's not easy for them to understand why you are saying that this technique is better than this technique that costs me more, for example. So there is this gap, and and this gap needs to be basically filled. Uh, with a language that is understandable. So sometimes, you know, industry talks about their problem, which might not be easily and directly understandable for basically um, uh, uh, academic members. So there is a gap and this gap needs to be filled in basically. So the technical factors of software maintenance, uh, programming languages, uh, which is the main, uh, one of the main uh, important impact. Uh, it has a very large impact on, on basically the quality of software maintenance tools. Uh, programming style, we know that every programmer has uh, their own style, basically, naming convention, whether they use object-oriented languages, but they are doing actually procedural programming, like the way that a uh, long time ago, 30, 40 years ago, 
we used to program in, in Pascal, for example, now we are using Java and we do it the exact same style. And, uh, program validation, test documentation, uh, configuration management, and module independency, which is basically one of the very low level uh, factors of software maintenance. That the, the, these stuff are considered as a technical factors that have large impact or big impact on software maintenance. So uh, when we talk about source code uh, analyzing or software maintenance, uh, if we want to technically divide it into two, again, two other groups. Uh, so what kind of results, what kind of activities we have? You see, we are not talking about factors. What kind of activities? When we talk about software maintenance, what we do really. So all these stuff can be divided into two different big groups. So the first one is understanding the general features of the system. For example, how many classes we have, functions, packages, variables, fields, comments, and, and stuff like this. So for example, here is one example I uh, have, uh, it is generated by, by, by the tool that I'm developing now. So you give a Java project and it gives you some basic information about the project. And also it goes uh, a little bit lower and, uh, you know, it says that, uh, it's, so for example, here we have 23 classes that are accessing three basically uh, uh, global variables. We have four classes that are accessing around 25 global variables. So these are global variables. And we know that accessing global variables freely in the software system is considered as uh, an anti-pattern basically and a couple of other things basically so the population of packages here for example the population of classes based on their types how many concrete classes we have how many abstract how many interface we have and uh, outgoing basically methods how many outgoing uh, incoming uh, methods we have and, and lots of other things so these are usually about understanding the structure of the software system. It's not necessarily saying this is bad or this is good. So the other part, uh, which usually should come after this part here, is detecting the code smell and anti-pattern. So you see, when you say that what is code smell and what is anti-pattern, so whatever basically, uh, so there is a, there is a, um, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a good definition by the author of this book, uh, uh, Robert Martin says that uh, code SML does not prevent your software from running, from, from executing basically. With code SML, uh, still you can run your software system, but in a long term, basically, it, it, uh, it makes lots of problems. So that's why it is very, very important to detect code smells and on the same for, for, for basically um, anti uh, patterns. So, uh, okay, so these, these two were basically the uh, steps in case you want to uh, perform uh, a project or you want to run a project that is related to software maintenance, these are the two things that you need to do basically. So first you need to understand the structure of the software system and then you're going to detect the code smell and anti-patterns. You see, usually for uh, uh, source code analyzing or software analyzing, we are not necessarily going to refactor the code. We are going to report them at least you know, what we are considering as a source code. The software maintenance itself includes, involves um, software refactoring, but source code analyzing does not necessarily involve source code refactoring, okay? So we are only reporting them. We say that, look, there is a problem here, there is a problem there, go and see whether it makes sense to do any modification on them or not. So as I say that um, better safe than sorry. So it's just, you know, we are, we are just reporting them. So um, different types of code analyzing. So again, uh, literature has uh, reported uh, three different types, static analyzing, uh, dynamic analyzing, and hybrid analyzing. So static analyzing is a type of techniques and technologies that do not need the software system to basically uh, 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 wrong, okay? So which means that the software system may have some 
the, the, the problem, some, even some errors depends on the parser we are using. So we don't need to necessarily run it. So that's why it's very useful because sometimes we need to analyze a software system that cannot be executed, basically. You can't run it. Dynamic analyzing is obvious is the techniques and technologies that you are using um, when the software system is running. So basically you need to have a scenario. So imagine that uh, we are going to analyze a software system that has a menu file, a date, blah, blah, blah. So when you want to work with that software system, you need to define a scenario. What is scenario? So where to start, you know, how to start running the software system. You, you double click on the, soft, on the software system icon, you run it. Whether you go to the file, for example, you know, menu, or you go to the edit, where you go after that, where you go after that, for example. So that can be a scenario. So you are basically only analyzing or, or observing a particular scenario, but in a very, very low level. And you're observing what is what are the inputs and how the inputs have impact on the execution. So uh, so that was just, you know, for, uh, and obviously the hybrid is a mixture of both of them, basically. So uh, <clears throat> the my general characteristics of uh, a code analysis uh, tool is basically uh, uh, inclu includes um, comprehensive flexibility to add a new functionality, having a, a user-friendly, basically UI and supporting multiple languages. So when we are talking about a source code analyzing tool, the first thing we want to make sure is that whether it supports multiple languages, because you know these days, the big projects that require uh, uh, automated analysis uh, mm -hmm. uh, are comprised of multiple different languages. You know, lots of scripting languages, lots of compiling languages. So we need to make sure that they are basically supported, and also user friendly uh, structure or UI or GUI. Because usually, you know, the the main developers that are fully familiar with the with with all the code artifacts are not are not the people who are going to analyze the software system. Usually, uh, higher level managers are going to analyze the software system and, and find out what are the problems or the or the development team basically. So it needs to have um, uh, basically a friendly user interface. So uh, a couple of uh, um, examples of uh, a specific tasks in uh, when we want to uh, basically uh, develop uh, a code analysis tool, for example, which are also considered as code as smell or, or good behavior or bad behavior. So I'll explain them. So one of them, uh, cohesion and the coupling. So usually when you create a class or a module, depends on the nature of the language. Some languages don't have the concept of class. Some of them, they have modules. Some of them have construct, uh, sorry, a struct, uh, or some of them don't have anything. But depends on the nature of the language, usually modules and classes um, should have a high cohesion. What does it mean? It means that the members of the classes should be related to each other. So this is this is an example of a low cohesive module or class. As you can see here, this is a class that does lots of different things. So this is this is considered as a low cohesion module, okay? Because this is related to lots of different places. And if in case you want to make some basic changes somewhere, lots of other places might be uh, affected by, by the changes you are basically making here. So um, one of the, and, and this is an example of a high cohesion, as you can see here, the functionality of the methods inside of this class are pretty much, you know, it, it, at least according to the name of the method, they seem to be uh, very similar to each other. So one of the ways that we can find the cohesion of the uh, uh, of the classes or modules is applying NLP techniques or or, or basically uh, you know textual analyzing basically. The other one, dead code uh, detection. So code that over the time are obsoleted uh, or basically uh, not in use anymore. Uh, you know, a new developer comes to the team. 
uh, there is a method so now you need to basically change the behavior of the of the of the method but you're scared of changing the method so you just keep it like that and you develop a new method so the old method is now going to be called dead code so imagine over the time the software system getting fatter and fatter and most of the content of the software system is actually not useful at all because they are dead code so it's important to to diagnose to detect dead code and basically remove them feature envy again when we have two classes or two modules where one module is strongly dependent on another module so for example the input parameters of one method in class a de depend on the fields or other methods of a different class so classes or modules in a software system should be independent from each other as much as possible basically definitely you can come up with an example saying that we can actually we're not talking about exceptions these are, these are the general rules basically then the other the other uh basically code smell uh which is actually a very very big field itself uh code clone or clone detection in the software system so uh again for multiple different reasons uh, in a software system, we might have different functionalities, different classes, different blocks of code that basically they are identical uh, uh, in some levels, basically. Okay, so the code and and, and obviously this is considered as uh, as a code a smell, and they need to be detected. And obviously, the one that is um, uh, 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 easier to maintain will be kept, and the other one will be deleted. So code clones um there are four different types of code clones type one two until four so i just have one example for each of them just to uh, uh, you know uh, get familiar with them basically so type one which is also called uh, exact clone um, so everything must be exactly the same in two basically uh, uh, versions of that functionality uh comments can be different because comments are not going to be compiled uh and then the locations of the uh, you know text obviously they well the, the the ordering should be the same but the location for example this is typed in the same line that's just a, a, a minor basically change here so this is called a uh, 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 type one which is very easy to detect the second one is called rename clone, uh, clones basically so uh, everything uh, you know in in two basically components are the same except the names can be different but like you see the types are the same you see we have integer we have integer double double and so on but even even the literal um, it can be different, uh, but uh, they have different names. So this is relatively also easy to, to detect. Uh, all we need to do is just create an abstract syntax tree and just see if the abstract syntax tree are identical, then we say that we have type two clone. Type three- Just a uh, time one there, Fashad. Okay. That's uh, okay. Yeah. So near miss clone uh, is just, we have one extra or one less a statement in the, in the um, in one of basically two uh, cases and the semantic clones which is the most uh, difficult type of basically clone to detect code clone to detect where the uh, functionality of this bit is exactly the same as this bit but um uh, you know uh, you don't see if you don't know programming if you look at them you don't say that they are the same if you don't know anything about programming language so it's a little bit a little bit uh, difficult to um uh, uh, to detect so the the next problem uh which basically uh we have in in code maintenance is comment code consistency so look at this example this method has been developed uh, has been updated recently so this method used to work with basically um textual files and it used to print the result in the console so that was the comment that used to be here for the previous version of the method. So now the method is updated. Now it, it reads CSV file, which is um, uh, 
a more a structure file than than text and the, the the output is returned but you see the comment is not updated so this is also a very important thing which is most of the time it is ignored by developers they don't care because it's not going to affect the the, the performance of the system obviously but the maintenance would be uh, would be very uh, slow in future so the consistency between comment and source code hierarchy a smell is another thing which is very very rare but if we have a situation where every class uh, we start from the most super class here so this super class has only and only one subclass this one has only and only one subclass and this one has only and only one subclass so if we have this situation which is kind of like a straight line only that there is no other class inheriting this class or there is no other class inheriting this class we say we have hierarchy smell there is no point to have such a distinct. We can just simply merge these three classes and inherit this one from the. Obviously, they should be interface and abstract because otherwise, if they are concrete, there are justification why we have them. And um, general purpose and a specific purpose purpose detection. So if if you want to understand the software system to find what classes, what modules have a more general role in the software system and what classes, what modules have more a specific role, you could actually draw the, the graph that shows the hierarchy. So you see vehicle is a super class of diesel vehicle, electric vehicle, gas vehicle, as you can see here, if you draw the graph, the most central node usually represent the most general purpose, basically. Uh, 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 a class in the in the program security vulnerable vulnerability uh it's another one that uh which is actually very important especially these days i i just put a very very simple example if the name is going to be read by end user so end user can easily hack this simple innocent source uh, source code here okay a sql server sorry sql database so if instead of name name we put or one equal to one then semicolon dash dash we know that in dash dash in in sql is used for comment so everything after dash dash will be ignored and this bit will return true so if you change username with this bit here okay if there is no input validation then basically the entire SQL database will be returned to the hacker. So this is simply, this can be simply detected in a source code anal uh, analyzer. So the, the very last thing, um, uh, basically say it, uh, or source code uh, analyzer and inspector tool is the tool that I'm already uh, working on it and hopefully uh it will go a little bit further to to become a, a bigger tool so that's that's the thing that is focusing on um software comprehensive uh, comprehension structure of the system code smell detection feature location and architecture recovery so basically the the, the very big image of the tool would be like this languages uh so the tool will be language independent in a sense that uh, everything from the language will be translated, will be converted into entities. So entities are language independent, and then the tasks would be basically performed based on the entities. So if a new language arrives, all you need to do is to inject the parser into the tool, and then the components will be converted to the entities, and then you do the um, tasks as you did for the other languages. So um, that said, hopefully, uh, if there will be a chance in the future, I will have a, another presentation to talk about specifically about this tool. Uh, but for now, we are still working on the tool. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for sharing. That was interesting. Um, OK, do you have any quick questions before I hand over to Christian? I might just ask a quick question to Farsha just to, to yeah. give him the opportunity to answer a question. So I'm, I'm wondering about uh, techniques like dependency injection, which are somehow designed to decouple everything, but wouldn't they also be hiding uh, problems in the code that still can exist uh, from tools like that? Or is there a way around this? 
Yeah, you see all, all these uh, injection, which is kind of like, again, uh, uh, code injection is, uh, is also considered as an umbrella term because we have comment injection, we have naming injection, we have, you know, there are lots of different things and it's, and it's uh, purely depend on the structure of the programming language, whether uh, it can be detected. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, most of the things uh, can be detected using static anal uh, 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 analysis. Um, there might be some situation, as you said, there might be hidden and it's not easily basically uh, detectable when we are doing static analysis. Why? Because we don't know what type of input uh, data we are basically dealing with. So in this situation, what we need to do, we need to use dynamic uh, analysis to try that particular scenario with different types of input and see what is the behavior of the software system. You see, when you are doing static anal uh, analyzing, you don't know what type of input data you're going to get. So, so this is the limitation of static analysis and, and there might be some hidden basically uh, structures or, or, or even code smell that you won't be able to detect them. So, um, uh, but but as I said, dynamic analysis is, is very, very expensive relatively because, you know, the software system needs to be running uh, uh, and then running the software system, you need to have the proper platform for that. So, uh, so yeah, the, the answer is no, is there definitely there are, there are lots of things that can be missed by uh, static uh, analyzing and it's because they really depend on the type of the input data we are getting. In relation to the um, cohesion. Okay. Yeah. So like you had like, like, I mean, who decides the criteria for what is high or low? I mean, that, that, that's like a design decision really, isn't it? It is, it is, it is very subjective. It's not really, uh, uh, well, there are uh, a couple of um, uh, criteria factors for that, uh, numerical factors for that, but is most of the time it is uh, uh, basically uh, subjective because sometimes we are talking about a class with, let's say 100 methods, okay? And sometimes we have a class with two methods and as a matter of fact, those two methods have a very similar names, uh, but in a class with 100 methods, we might have most of them with similar names, but some of them different names. So it will give you a low cohesion while the smaller class with two methods gives you a very high cohesion. But in fact, the, the, the bigger class actually has a higher cohesion. So it's not only the name of the methods, it can be also the functionalities and also the input parameters. So for example, if, if uh, every single method here points the parameters inside of these methods, input parameters, pointing to some other classes, some other regions of the source code, and they are completely independent from each other, then we say that actually the cohesion is not that high because you know name is only one factor. What they return basically, how is their, their dependency? What other methods are called within these methods basically are also important. What other fields are touched at each basically method is also important. 